Hi, and welcome to the walkthrough of the animal matching game from Chapter 1 of Head First C Sharp, the brain-friendly guide to learning C Sharp published by O'Reilly Media. I'm Andrew Stallman, co-author of the book. I started by downloading the free PDF of the first four chapters of the book from our GitHub page. I'll flip back and forth between the PDF and Visual Studio. We'll start on page 6 of the PDF. Let's build a game. We're going to build an animal matching game where the players shown a grid of 16 animals need to click on pairs of them to make them disappear. This page has a screenshot of the animal matching game that you're going to build. You're going to build this game in several parts. First, you'll create the project and use XAML to build the window. Then you'll write c -sharp code to add a random animal emoji to the window. You're going to need to handle user clicking on the pairs of emoji. And finally, you'll make the game more exciting by adding a timer. The first thing that you'll do is start up a new instance of Visual Studio 2019 and create a new WPFapp.net project. When you first start up Visual Studio, it shows you the Create Project window. If you don't see it, choose File New Project from the menu to pop up the window. Search the templates for WPF and create a new WPFapp.net project and click Next. Enter the project name, Match Game, then click Create, and Visual Studio will create your project. While we wait for Visual Studio to finish building the project, let's flip to page 13 and have a look at what we're going to build. The window is laid out using a grid with four columns and five rows. Each animal is displayed in a text block control, and it has a timer displayed in the bottom in its own text block control. Let's start building the UI for the animal matching game. First thing you can do is use the zoom dropdown and the four buttons at the bottom of the designer to turn on grid lines, turn on snapping, and toggle the artboard background. Next, you'll change the size of your app's window. Move your mouse anywhere in the XAML editor in the first eight lines inside that window tag. Expand the layout section in the properties window on the right, and then use the width box to change the width from 800 to 400. Change the window's title by looking in the XAML code and finding the title line. Change it from main window to find all of the matching animals. You can change it either in the XAML code or the properties window on the right. When you make a change in the XAML editor, you'll see the change show up in the properties window. And when you change the properties, you'll see the change show up in the XAML. Now you'll add rows and columns to your grid. It might look like your main window is empty, but if you look at the bottom, you'll actually see there's a line with an opening grid tag and another with a closing grid tag. You're going to use the designer to add rows and columns. Move your mouse over the left side of the window in the designer. When a plus appears over the cursor, click the mouse to add a row. And then repeat this four times to add a total of five rows. Then hover, hover over the top of the window and add four columns. Make sure your window looks like the screenshot in the book. The columns you added are different widths, and we'll fix that now. Look at the XAML code that got added when you added the rows and columns. It has a bunch of column and row definition lines. Each has a number and an asterisk. Now I'll make the rows and columns equal size, and you can see in the book exactly where to click and what to change in the properties window. Go to the first column definition tag and click on the width value. You'll see the corresponding value in the properties window. Use the black box on the right to reset it. Then do the same for the rest of the column definitions. You can also copy and paste them. Then do the same to reset the height for the row definitions. You can either use the properties window or you can use the XAML editor. When you change one, it affects the other. And when you're done, you should have five equally spaced columns and rows. And the XAML for the column and row definitions should match the book. You can compare them closely to make sure it looks right. Make sure the XAML in your app matches the book exactly before you move on. WPF apps use text block controls to display text, and you'll use them to display the animals to find a match. So let's add one to the window now. When you add your text block, it will have default values that match the line of XAML code on the book's page. 
Your properties might end up in a different order than in the book. As long as they're the same values, it's okay. Then we'll use the designer to change those properties. Expand the common WPF control section in the toolbox and drag a text block into the cell in the second column in the second row. You'll see a text block tag added to your XAML code at the bottom. You'll use the layout and text sections in the properties window to set your text blocks properties. Set its horizontal and vertical alignment. Use the black box to reset the margins. Then expand the text section. Set the font size to 36 pixels. Then what you're going to do is close the text section, expand the common section, and use the text property to change the text and text block to a question mark. You should now have a question mark centered in that cell. Finally, if you look at your XAML code, you'll actually see there is a text wrapping property. and We want to remove that. So use the search box in the properties panel to search for the word wrap and change the text wrapping property to no wrap. These in your XAML tags can be in any order and you can add line breaks. We'll add line breaks in our video just so you can see things a little bit better. And now we'll save. Make sure you save often. Now we have an exercise. You have one text block and that's a great start, but we need 16 text blocks to show all the animals to match. So we're asking you to figure out how to add more XAML to add an identical text block to all of the cells in the first four rows of the grid. Now, as you watch our video, you'll see how we solve our exercise. We do it in a couple of ways. We'll right click on the text block in the visual designer, click copy, then click paste, and then move the text blocks around. We'll also go to the bottom and edit the XAML using a copy and paste on the text itself. In the end, the code that we have at the bottom will match the code in the book. In the end, you'll know you've solved this exercise correctly. When you have 16 text block controls in the top four rows in each of the cells, you can see a question mark in each of the cells. And if you count the lines with text block tags in them in the XAML, they'll see exactly 16 text blocks. Here's the solution. Make sure the solution in your XAML matches the solution in the book exactly. Properties can be in a different order, but you definitely need exactly 16 text blocks. 
Congratulations, you've finished designing enough of the main window to get the next part of your game working. And now it's time to add C-sharp code to make your game work. Use the Solution Explorer to edit mainwindow.zamble.cs. This is where your C-sharp code will be. You'll add the line set up game just like you see in the book. And then you'll click the quick actions icon and use the generate method option to generate a new method. Now try running your app. Click the button at the top of the window to start your app. Notice that as soon as it starts up, you'll see it pop up a window that says exception user unhandled. This may look like a problem, but it actually means that you did things correctly. Use the stop button at the top of the IDE to stop your app. Now you'll finish your setup game method. Start adding code to it. Type list and open bracket, and you'll see the IntelliSense window pop up with a list of options, and choose string. Follow the instructions in the book to finish writing that line of code. When you get to the end of the line, don't hit enter yet. Type in an opening curly bracket. Visual Studio will add the closing bracket for you. Add the semicolon after the closing bracket and add a line break. Next, you're going to add eight pairs of emoji values in your list, and you'll use the Windows Emoji panel to do it by pressing the Windows logo key and period. When the Windows Emoji panel pops up, you can actually start typing animal names like octopus. The Emoji panel will show you matching emoji. Double click on one of them to paste it straight into your code. Make sure there's a double quote in front of each emoji and a double quote and a comma after each emoji. Add pairs of emoji. We used an octopus, a blowfish, an elephant, a whale, camel, brontosaurus, kangaroo, and hedgehog. We also used copy and paste because you can copy and paste emoji just like any other characters. Now you'll add the rest of the code for the method. And you'll want to be careful with periods, parentheses, and brackets. Notice in the screenshot in the book, there is a squiggly underline under the word main grid in the for each line. To make that go away, you'll need to go back to the XAML editor and click on the grid tab, then go to the properties window and enter main grid in the name box. Then the squiggly lines will go away and the IntelliSense will work on main grid. Until you do that, you won't actually be able to use autocomplete or IntelliSense on main grid. But when you type dot children, it won't automatically pop up that IntelliSense window. As you get used to using Visual Studio to enter code, you'll come to rely more and more on the AI-assisted IntelliSense. We'll finish filling in the rest of the setup game method. In our video, you'll see us flipping back and forth between the PDF and Visual Studio you'll probably end up doing the same thing. If you're using the paper book, but you'd feel more comfortable seeing the screenshot on screen like in our video, you can still download the PDF of the first four chapters from the book's GitHub page.
Now we'll go back to the XAML editor, click on the grid tag, and use the property window to set its name to main grid. As soon as we do, those red squiggles under main grid in the code will disappear. We put this into the project because it's actually a pretty common thing that happens, and we wanted to give you the tools to help solve it on your own in the future. Now, if you've followed along with the book, and your C Sharp and XAML are exactly the same as they are in the book, then it's time to run your program. Click the Run button at the very top of the window, and Visual Studio will launch your game. When your program first runs, you might see the Runtime Tools hovering at the top of the window. Click the first button in the Runtime Tools to bring up the Live Visual Tree panel in the IDE, then click the first button in the Live Visual Tree to disable the Runtime Tools. Every time you run your app, it should give you a new random selection of animals. Stop the game and rerun it, um, either by pressing the Stop button in the toolbar closing the window with its X button, or click the Restart button in the toolbar to run your game several times. Do this a few times and admire what you've built. Now we'll flip ahead to the next part of the project, where you add code to handle mouse clicks. Go to the Properties window and click the Lightning Bolt button to toggle it to show event handlers. Then go back to the designer, click on that first text box, and with your Properties window, showing event handlers, find the event called mouse down and double click in the box to the right of the event. The IDE will automatically add an event handler method called text block underscore mouse down that will get called every time that this text block is clicked. On page 36 of the book, we have a sharpen your pencil paper and pencil exercise where you look at some code and do your best to figure out what it does. It's okay if you're not 100% right. The goal is to start training your brain to recognize C Sharp as something you can read and make sense of. Now we're going to carefully add the text block mouse down code to the app. First, we'll add the first two lines with last text block clicked and finding match above the first line of the method that the IDE added. Then we'll fill in the code for the method. Now we've got to be really careful about equal signs. There's a big difference between a single equal sign and a double equal sign, which you'll learn about in chapter two. You can watch us add the method, or you can go ahead and skip to the next part of the walkthrough. Right now, only the first text block has an event handler hooked up to its mouse down event. So let's hook up the other 15 text blocks to the same event too. Now, you could do it by selecting each one in the designer and entering text block underscore mouse down to the box next to the mouse down. But we saw that all that does is add a property to the text block tag. 
So instead, we're using search and replace to do the work for us. We're going to choose Find and Replace, Quick Replace from the Edit menu, search for slash caret at the end of each tag, and replace it with mouse down equals text block underscore mouse down slash caret. Exactly the same thing that the designer would have done if we had typed that directly into the property window. We'll need to be really careful about exactly how we do the search and replace to make sure we end up with a valid XAML code. The instructions on page 38 in the book show you exactly what to do. Now that the search and replace is done and your XAML code is updated so that every text block calls the mouse down method, go ahead and run your app and test it out. If you copied everything exactly from the book, you should see animals disappear when you click them. If you click an animal, it disappears. Click its match, and that one disappears too. Click one that doesn't match, and the first animal reappears. In this last part, we're going to finish the game by adding a timer to make things more exciting. Start by finding the namespace keyword near the top of mainwindow.xaml.cs, where your C-sharp code lives, and add the line using system.windows.threading semicolon directly underneath it. Be really careful about capitalization and exactly where we place this line. Next, we'll find the line that says public partial class main window and add these three lines of code just after the opening curly bracket. By now, you should start to be getting used to seeing the IntelliSense windows pop up and help you enter your code. That's going to be really useful for you as you keep working with C-sharp and Visual Studio. A timer ticks by calling a method over and over again. So we need to tell our timer how frequently to tick and what method to call. We'll position our mouse cursor right before we call the setup game method and add these two lines of code. The first line tells the timer how frequently to tick, every tenth of a second, and the second tells it what method to call every time it ticks. When we type this plus equals, Visual Studio will prompt us to press tab to insert a method called timer underscore tick. We'll do that, and it will automatically generate this method for us, just like it generated the setup game method earlier in this project. When the timer ticks, we wanted to update one more text block at the very bottom of the app. So we'll drag a text block into the lower left square like we dragged earlier. And then we'll use the name box at the top of the properties window to give it the name time text block. Next, we'll reset its margins, center it in the cell, and then we'll set the font size property to 36 pixels and the text property to elapsed time. This is just like what we did with the earlier text block. We want the elapsed time text to be centered at the bottom of the window, but span the entire window, not just be in one of those little cells. So we'll find the column span property and set it to four, so it spans all four columns. When the game is over, this text block will display the total elapsed time and a message, play again. The player will click it to start a new game. So we'll need to add its own mouse down event on handler. We'll call it time text block underscore mouse down. We type the method into the properties window. You can also just double click the properties window. It'll up just like before, 
Visual Studio will update the XAML to add the mouse down property and it'll add a method to the C-sharp code. Next, we'll add the code into the new method that Visual Studio added for us. It'll check to see if you found all eight matches, and if it did, it will call the setup game method. That will start a new game when the player clicks the text block, but only if the game is actually over. If the game is still running, it'll do nothing. Now we just need to finish the timer tick method that gets called by the timer. The timer ticks calling its timer tick method every tenth of a second. So each time it's called, it'll keep track of the number of tenths of seconds elapsed, update the text block to show the elapsed time, and if the player has found all eight matches, it'll stop the timer and then show the message play again. Now that the timer tick method is done, we can run the app. Whoa, when we run it, something went wrong. We got an exception. It says system.argument out of range exception. Can you guess what caused this error? What do you think happened? We've got a bug in our app, and understanding a bug is the first step in fixing it. So we're going to use Visual Studio's debugger to troubleshoot the problem. An exception is C-sharp's way of telling you that something went wrong. Now we're going to figure out what went wrong. If we start and restop the app a few times, and then if we move the exception window out of the way, we can see that it always stops on the same line. It's that second line in that for each. It says string next emoji equals animal emoji, and then in brackets index. We'll place a breakpoint on that line by putting our cursor on that line and then choosing toggle breakpoint from the debug menu. Now if we stop and then restart our app, it'll break on that line or pause execution and let us figure out what's going on inside our program. Anytime you're tracking down bugs or debugging an app, it's all about gathering evidence figuring out what caused the problem and fixing it. So we're going to gather evidence by looking in the locals window at the bottom of the Visual Studio IDE. Watch the count for animal emoji as you keep running the app and it keeps hitting the breakpoint. The count counts down from 16 to 15, down to 2, down to 1. And when it hits 0, that's when the exception pops up. And now we can sleuth out what's actually causing the bug. It's crashing because it's trying to get the next emoji from the animal emoji list, but the list is empty. So what caused it to run out? There's a pretty detailed explanation of what's going on in the book. The short story is that it's pulling an emoji out of that list for each text block in the app, but it runs out of emoji before it runs out of text blocks. So we can fix that by not pulling out a emoji if it finds a text block whose name is time text block. So we'll add that code now. We'll go to the line just under that line that says for each, um, right after its opening curly brace, and add this if statement. That will make sure that we only run the code that pulls the line out of the list of emoji if it's on a text block for an emoji and not for the text block for the time elapsed at the bottom of the app. Once that code is added, we can run the app again. And now the exception doesn't pop up. 
All right, it's time to finish the game. We just need to add three lines of code to the very end of the setup game method that starts the timer and resets the game. Then we just need to add one more statement to the middle block of the if else in the text block mouse down method. That increases the matches found by one every time the player successfully finds a match. And now the code is done. Congratulations, we've built our first game in C Sharp. Go ahead and run it. Thanks so much for watching this walkthrough. And we really hope you get a lot out of our book, Head for C Sharp, published by O'Reilly Media. A fast and fun way to learn C Sharp. It's a brain-friendly, visual, and highly engaging guide to learning C Sharp, and we think it's the most fun and effective way you can do it. Visit our GitHub page for more information. And while you're there, download the first four chapters for free. Good luck with your C-sharp learning.